uh, although my uh, title is uh, focusing on advances in soft X-ray spectral cartography, and I will underline the word spectral because uh, that's really my uh, uh, passion, understanding spectroscopy and using it for important uh, things. I'm actually going to hijack the talk a little bit and sleep in, slip in some uh, non typography results uh, in the context of uh, a major trust that uh, my group is working in collaboration with uh, Drew Higgins. And I, I'm not, do I get a pointer? No, oh, it's, it's a red one. I can't see red. So no. Anyway, so my, colla my collaborator is a, a young assistant professor in the chemical engineering department at McMaster who has uh, expertise in uh, many areas of energy materials and also a lot of experience in synchrotron techniques, uh, primarily X-ray absorption, but he was also a staff scientist at Stanford uh, for the latter part of his uh, two-year postdoc there. And I wanted this time also to acknowledge uh, my uh, very talented students, Chen Ying Zhang and uh, Heitam Araki, who've really done a lot of the fascinating things in the area that I want to focus on, which is using uh, sticks and typography to study uh, electrochemical uh, reactions in an aqueous media uh, um, inside uh, the sticks. So in, we're doing in situ modifications of samples and, me and measuring the changes that are happening uh, with the uh, X-ray microscopy techniques. So uh, here's Zhang uh, uh, Yang and uh, Hei, they're color coded. Uh, and the other person I want to mention at the beginning also is my collaborator, uh, Mark Pops, who really helped up set up the CLS Sixon uh, system. Uh, but it, very recently, he's made some tremendous advances in the technology for doing uh, in situ uh, flow electrochemical systems uh, in uh, sticks in the soft X ray sticks in that area, which, as you will see, is quite challenging. And uh, it's really due to the creativity of him and his students that we were able to do the experiments. So, what you have in the middle is a playback of uh, uh, one of the type of in situ technographic measurements. Uh, that we make. Uh, we're working at the copper uh, L edge around 940 EV, where you can very nicely uh, identify the oxidation states of copper. I'll talk about that more on later. But what I want to show you that is this is a uh, set of images recorded through the edge, copper 2P edge. And uh, those changes there can be very readily uh, inverted into uh, uh, maps of the oxidation state species. And just to show as a single frame, one-to-one uh, -one comparison of sticks and the micrography, you see a very nice improvement of spatial resolution. That was work that was done at the Soleil uh, six and uh, beamline Hermes uh, in October of last year. So uh, this is speaking to the converted here. Uh, very quickly, we know that uh, the one of the strong points of using coherent uh, x-rays is that you can diffract from various objects, both periodic and uh, aperiodic. And looking at that uh, diffraction pattern uh, with the appropriate uh, analysis, we can invert it into a complex uh, refractive index uh, uh, signal from the sample and a complex light wave field uh, signal, which is the X-ray probe coming into your sample. And so this diffraction pattern, uh, speckle pattern, sometimes people call it, is essentially a Fourier transform of the properties uh, in uh, real and imaginary space of the uh, object and, and the probe. And this goes back a long ways. Uh, now, uh, along with uh, Nash Kurtz, Chris Jacobson at NSLS1 had some of the very early uh, demonstrations that uh, you could uh, find ways to solve the phase problem. So uh, the uh, issue uh, and the challenge of uh, conventional CDI is that uh, you basically are taking a single diffraction image and trying to uh, determine uh, properties of the probe and object from uh, inverting that single image. It can be done. There's all sorts of fancy mathematical ways to do it, but in general, it's challenging. Uh, if you don't have a decent start, starting point for your object and probe functions, it's not hard to get a reliable convergence. And there's been crazy schemes where you would launch maybe 200 uh, tries at it and you take the 100 best, this sort of thing, which is not the most satisfactory way of doing science. If you add one more component and do what could be called scanning uh, CDI, otherwise known as typography, we can use the overlapping space to place constraints on the mathematical reconstruction process. 
And in addition to being very much improving the ability to reconstruct uh, the data sets uh, in these uh, multiple sample points with overlap, uh, it also allows you to essentially go to a much, much larger field of view. Uh, and uh, it looks much more like a conventional microscope than a physics uh, computer scattering project. Uh, it is still complex to uh, process to uh, reconstruct it, but uh, the codes that are available nowadays have a very high degree of reliability. You can do the reconstruction and believe the result instead of having to sort of take a statistical approach to what's there. So how do we do this in the soft X-ray? We adapt a scanning transmission X-ray microscope, which is a, a zone plate focusing device. Uh, where normally you would have a uh, single channel detector, we typically use a, a phosphor to down convert soft X rays to the visible region and then use classic hyperphones photomultiplier to measure them. So, in the normal sticks, um, we're limited by the properties of the zone plate. And zone plates are quite good in the soft X ray. You can have ones which will give you 10 nanometer uh, spatial resolution. More typically, people are getting more like 30 nanometers. Um, and it's a relatively uh, efficient technique. But if we uh, add at the back of the uh, sample, exchange that single point detector for a single X-ray sensitive uh, X-ray camera, we are then able to do tychography. And the advantage is now is that we have a platform that's designed for imaging. There's a lot of been work over the years that have been invested in Stixum to use interferometry to get very accurate positioning and accurate reading of the positions of your probe relative to your points on the sample. And all of these factors mean that it's a relatively simple transition from uh, doing single point detection uh, transmission signals to the whole typographic experiment uh, by taking advantage of all the effort that's been put into making Stixums. Okay, so just a quick example to show the practicality and the utility of this technique. This is actually one of the very first of the soft X-ray typography examples by David Shapiro and collaborators at the Advanced Light Source. Um, and uh, in addition to showing with a, a, a very uh, special test pattern that they can reach down to three nanometer spatial resolution, this is what I'm interested in, spectrotypography. The fact that by changing the photon energy, measuring at sequences of photon energies, we can sort out the chemistry of the sample at high spatial resolution. In this case, this is in the context of lithium battery optimization. This is a twinned or an interpenetrating double crystal a lithium iron phosphate uh, particle in a lithium battery where they can charge and discharge it and show the uh, active uh, redox chemistry being one where the iron uh, oxidation states from changes from iron two to iron three, which you see from this shift in the blue and the red curves in the uh, spectral plot. Um, and uh, there's a, a very a lot of new insights that came about uh, from the typographic studies of uh, uh, lithium battery uh, materials. So this is one of the sort of things they do. This technique helped contribute the understanding that in lithium batteries, the uh, Transitions uh, in the individual particles making up an electrode don't necessarily happen uh, simultaneously with each uh, uh, intercalation of the uh, lithium into it, uh, lithium iron phosphate or iron phosphate uh, crystal uh, contributing partly. What it is, in fact, that at least at low uh, discharge rates, uh, individual particles change from zero to 100% iron two to iron three. And it's like pop, 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 pop. So in order to study the process of the intercalation, you want to be able to identify those uh, particles which are in the uh, process of uh, changing. Here, using the spectral capabilities of uh, spectrotypography, uh, they're able to map over a region of space uh, the, those crystals which are in the uh, reduced state, iron two, or in the oxidized state, iron three. And uh, they're looking for the ones that are intermediate, have some. Uh, species of iron, other two, and some are three, which in this color coding would be yellow. Now, you guys may have fantastic color sensitivity, but I have a hard time seeing the yellow amongst the red and green uh, field there. Whoops. And so, this is just a very nice illustration of the value of going to a higher resolution photography. It's not the same area, but it's a similar area and uh, similar materials. And what you see is even with a very good sticks of 25 nanometer spatial resolution, you still have a hard time identifying those particular particles you want to study. 
uh, which are in the process of transitioning and therefore undergoing inflation <coughs> to rise of combatants. Once you get the better spatial resolution of dichography and you do the multi energy mapping, you can see it's very, very easy to spot the uh, crystal which can offset. Okay, so uh, that's just a quick uh, connection to coherent diffraction since that's the uh, uh, su subject for cool work. And so, what I'm going to tell you a bit about is some of my work in uh, uh, soft texture spectrophotography, two different areas, uh, a biological example where uh, bacteria, which have little magnets in them, uh, are being studied. And a second one in the collaboration with people at Soleil, where we're pushing the photon energy range where you can do tychography well down uh, below 500 EV, which is the traditional lower limit for people using uh, CCD uh, X ray families. So, I'll talk a little bit about that. Yet. But the bulk of the talk is going to focus on our efforts to do in situ uh, spectral microscopy with either stick support tychography to study. Uh, copper catalysts or electrocatalysts for conversion of CO2 to uh, more valuable uh, reduced oxidation state uh, materials, in particular, uh, carbon zero, carbon carbon bonds. So I'll tell you uh, about our in-situ flow electrochemical system, show you an example of work that we did in September 21 at Canadian Light Source on in-situ stixum, give you a sense of what the value added is doing, of doing these uh, measurements, and then uh, what we're very proud of is that last October, we uh, were able for the first time to combine the challenges of an in-situ for electrochemical system and typography, both of which are individually quite challenging at this point in time, not routine, uh, and able to combine them so that we could do in-situ spectrophotography. So you might ask, because a lot of the people of this uh, community are coming from a hard X-ray perspective, right? So, we got a basically phase sensitivity. We can look at things uh, that uh, you don't have strong interactions with your sample, but uh, using the spectrographic technique, you can really improve the resolution over some uh, other spatial result like method of studying samples. So why hasn't soft X-ray uh, tachography developed as quickly and as extensively as a hard X-ray? Well, in many uh, ways, it's uh, limitations of the uh, CCD cameras uh, at the soft X-ray regime. They're not uh, efficient. In hard X-ray, you have these beautiful Dectris cameras, which have 100% uh, 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 sensitivity and no background. Um, also, strong, soft X-rays uh, interact strongly with your sample. And uh, that can be a good thing, because I put it down here also as so one of the advantages. Uh, but it's a disadvantage in that you have to really worry about radiation damage uh, because of that strong interaction. And so, uh, and finally, uh, in the practical implementation in this system, uh, in order to couple uh, a system to modify the property of the sample uh, inside our microscopes, uh, it's very hard in the soft X ray because our zone plate uh, focal lengths are typically in the millimeter range. And so, we're trying to uh, put a sample conditioning uh, system uh, with a, a few millimeters of space to do this. Okay, so uh, that's basically the pitch. You're doing scanning CDI. Here's an example from measurements I made in 2014 at the uh, B911 at the Advanced Light Source. And what I'm doing is I'm playing back the uh, individual, oops, the individual uh, points where we're measuring these diffraction patterns. I, have of course, changed the scale. It's a logarithmic scale so that you can uh, see those scattering speckles as the beam hits these individual objects here, which in the parent sticks of image, you can't even really see what it is. When we do the typographic uh, inversion, you see very nicely that this is a set of uh, magnetite chains that bacteria of a certain type like to make for reasons that we're still trying to understand. So uh, a little bit more example of uh, 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 material from this example. Uh, using a 60 nanometers to 70 nanometer spatial resolution sticks, and we can barely distinguish the individual uh, magnetosomes with the uh, uh, tachography. We're very much able to uh, visualize and, and almost start to see the, the faceting of, uh, of these uh, single crystal materials uh, through the improved spatial resolution. And while we don't have the same resolution as a TDM, uh, we are uh, fidelity in terms of having the same uh, image as we do. So there are other properties of uh, tachography that are interesting. 
one of the ways uh, uh, that uh, tachography can be used to advantage is by localizing the signal after you've done the processing in space, because of your higher spatial resolution, you can become much more sensitive. So this is just an example. If you use a, uh, a coarser resolution uh, zone plate, you get a certain optical density. If you get a better zone plate, you get more optical density because we have only a 50 nanometer target and we are spilling over the beam into areas where you don't have the nanometer plate uh, 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 property. And so this is uh, uh, um, emphasized even more in tachography if you're looking at a very small region of space. It also points out that with respect to tachography, we can get uh, higher in 2P spectra that are equivalent to uh, what you see in a true conventional absorption measurement by transmission. Okay, and so I, I'm not going to time to go into any of the details, but this was a, a paper we did in 2016 and NAS uh, just uh, looking at one individual bacterial cell. So it's about a micron long by about a quarter and a half a micron wide. And what we found fascinating was that with this improved performance, we can actually just start to get insights in how an individual bacteria grows these uh, magnetite single crystals. So uh, D here, which is a nice, healthy uh, magnetosome fully formed, you get a spectrum that's pretty much mapping onto a uh, magnetite. But you can have regions here where you're in a gap between two chains, and you can still see there's iron, but it's much more iron too rich because of the low, stronger low energy peak. And V up here is also a, a, a crystal that's in closest to forming, uh, but has a slightly different uh, uh, signal. So we basically uh, leveraged these measurements. We didn't do it with tachography, but we did what's called a time series where we could follow as a population of bacteria grew uh, iron uh, magnetite inside their cells. Uh, and that's a whole other story, but I put the reference here. So by having higher uh, spatial resolution with tachography, which would be a wonderful follow-up to our sticks of measuring, you can really start to get insights in this case to a biomineralization mechanism. Okay, so the other thing I want to uh, tell you about is pushing the uh, energy range over which you do tachography. As I say, most tachographic systems in the world now are using CCDs, at least in the soft X-ray. And it's only recently that scientific CMOS uh, cameras that are adapted to the soft X-ray range uh, that started to become available. And the, the detector group uh, in collaborate uh, Soleil, uh, in collaboration with the detector group here at uh, Max Four, uh, have uh, really made these uh, Diana cameras uh, stand up in mass to uh, work over uh, energy photon energies below 500 dB. And so this is an example of work we did in 21, published really last year, uh, just showing that uh, right down at the carbon edge on a sample of carbon nanotubes, you get the sort of speckled. Uh, pattern, which is the signal that's giving you the spatial resolution. And what's really nice is we showed that you could get this type of uh, tachographic uh, response using a highly focused beam. So instead of a 30 or 40 nanometer focused beam from the system, we change our uh, optics such that we're using the one micron beam. So you can see that this is basically the spatial shape of the X-rays that we put in because of one micron the uh, projection of the uh, annulus of the zone plate is what, where the light is. And you can see only about 30% of the uh, light is hitting the actual uh, carbon nanotubes, which are going to give us a spectral signature. We get reasonable resolution, not as good as we hoped for various reasons. And if we compare to a high resolution uh, zone plate system, we don't see a heck of a lot of difference in spatial resolution. But we do uh, have uh, some advantages. So another property of interest to carbon nanotubes, they're geometrically anisotropic, so they have a strong uh, X-ray linear dipolism. And so we were here by looking at uh, maps of the same area, recorded the vertical and horizontal uh, linear polarization, taking the difference. We can map very nicely the linear and the horizontal uh, tubes, which of course you can see when you're high, uh, you can see this change in the uh, response that the NASA five star transition of carbon nanotubes. The other thing I find fascinating is that uh, there are potential advantages in looking not at the absorption channel, but the phase channel, particularly at uh, low energy edges like the carbon edge, where you might anticipate you can work at photon energies below the onset of where the material absorbs, and so you can to some extent, reduce the problems of energy damage. 
that still needs to be explored and uh, uh, demonstrated. One of the really nice things about using defocused beams uh, for trichography is that, of course, you don't need as many sampling points in order to be able to build up the picture of the area you want to look at. So as a demonstration, we're looking here at a 10 by 10 uh, micron field of view. And when we did this with one micron defocus, we could get all those set of diffraction patterns in 10 minutes of acquisition. If, on the other hand, we had used the fully focused uh, 50 nanometers of spot, it would have taken us two hours and completely carbonized the sample. So uh, there are uh, issues there. Second example uh, that we explored, again, to push the energy to lower uh, energy values is a set of boron nitride nano ribbons. They're beautifully structured uh, nano materials, uh, very much like a piece of bamboo where the segments are linked to each other. And uh, we're measuring the full spectroscopy with dichography, as well as the dichroism. Uh, and if we look at the, these are the two peak energies, one is the five star at the boron and the nitrogen edges. And you can see as you go to lower energy, uh, the magnitude of the scattering, the, the range of it is about uh, an order of magnitude less. But in fact, there's really strong interaction there such that the annulus, which represents just the x-rays passing through the sample without any interaction, is barely visible here. All that speckle type signal right where the annulus should be. So you're really uh, scattering everything. Whereas in the uh, nitrogen 1S, even though it's better quality, some of the speckles are better defined, the annulus itself is the dominant uh, signal uh, in the images that we get the diffraction units. And so what we can do here is we can use the spectral typography characteristics to do that chronic mapping uh, of these uh, more than narrow two tubes, and you can, you can start to get insights from the way the spectroscopy varies across and along the structure of the nanotubes. Okay, so now to the main key piece. Is there a clock somewhere? No, it's a clock. Just give me a Okay, so I'm happy. Okay, so I better move on. So, you know, why are my, am I interested in why do I think other people should be interested in pushing spatial resolution and spectral cap capabilities for material studies? The motivator here really is the idea that if we can improve electrocatalysis for various types of conversions, we are able actually to use uh, so called excess renewable energy. We know now it's much cheaper right now to uh, generate electricity by solar and wind power. It's not unfortunately uh, always at the time you want it. And so there could be a win-win situation here where you can use the uh, excess capacity under high wind or bright days uh, to do a chemical or electrochemical transformation and uh, use this as a carbon free cell. So this is typically then going to be a device where uh, you have to combine uh, some sort of catalyzed CO2 reduction with an oxygen evolution reaction to uh, transform CO2 into other uh, products. And again, the vision is that uh, we build a carbon cyclic environment that has nothing to do with fossil fuels. So how are we going to improve this? We need to optimize catalysts. So we need to be able to understand what's happening when the catalytic reactions are happening. And that's why the push is for this issue. So Drew Higgins has been the master for uh, three years now, has uh, set up a very ambitious uh, set of uh, experimental teams dealing with all aspects from synthesis of new catalyst materials to integration into devices to electrochemical evaluation and then various characterizations. So his expertise is in X-ray spectroscopy on the characterization side, and uh, we're collaborating then to combine soft and hard X-ray techniques to study these materials. So this is more of a schematic of a practical device feeding CO2 in and then looking at the uh, output in terms of analyzing the chemical species form. And the thing you note is that although reducing CO2 from its four plus oxidation state to a two plus oxidation state in carbon monoxide or formic acid uh, can be catalyzed by a wide range of uh, metal elements. If you want to go to making carbon-carbon bonds and carbon and effectively the nominal zero uh, oxidation state, uh, copper is the only game in town. So there's a lot of focus right now to optimize copper-based uh, electrocatalysts for CO2 reduction. So I'll yeah, we'll go through this quickly. While these uh, catalysts work, they don't work very efficiently and they have uncontrollable product specificity. 
And so these are the two main goals, make it more efficient and get it such that you can tune a given catalyst structure so that you uh, produce one particular uh, product in higher yield than others. And of course, that means from a chemist's point of view, you want to understand the mechanisms so that you can start to doctor the surfaces of catalysts to push the reaction in the area of interest. So again, motivation for institution. So I'll give you a little segue on the SIXM because it's important to understand how we process our data. We process the technography, spectral technography data, essentially the same as our SIXM data. What we're showing you here is the playback of a copper deposition on the working electrode of our in situ device at the uh, copper uh, to the edge. And uh, this is just a small area of the total area of study. And we can take the uh, data set, which is a spectrum in each pixel in the area of study, and uh, fit it to reference spectra, which can be recorded uh, separately uh, onto materials. And if we do that, whoops, I lost my hand. Yeah. Okay. If we do that, uh, you can uh, basically divide what are called component maps. And if these uh, reference spectra are on a quantitative response basis, up to the density per nanometer, we can get uh, quantification. So the grayscale of each component map uh, is quantitative in terms of nanometer thickness. If it's quite light, they're at the maximum of 20, 220, or 34 uh, nanometers. And uh, we can then uh, combine these in some sort of uh, red blue, blue composite to really understand what's happening. And so what you'll be seeing is an awful lot of these color composites and not an awful lot of raw spectra. Okay, so a little segue into spectroscopy. The copper uh, 2P edge is just beautiful for studying the issue of oxidation states uh, of copper catalysts. And why? Because if you look at copper metal, it's got a uh, e 10 s one configuration, and there's only that 4S hole that you can uh, do the transmission. In. And that's this big broad peak here. Because it's a metal well-defined structure, you get zillions as well. If you go to the copper one oxidation state, now you have a 4S zero. Uh, so you get a stronger transition, but more or less at the same energy. And the interesting thing is, in contrast to virtually all the other of the 3D transition metals, when you go to the highest oxidate, common oxidation state, copper two, 3D9, you're opening a hole in the 3D state and you get this whopping big transition because P to D transitions are much stronger than P to S transitions. And so you have very, very clear differentiation of these uh, spectral features. And we can take this energy, that energy, that energy, and that energy and decompose the chemistry uh, in, in, in as accurate a way as if we take 50 or 100 of energies to get the spectroscopy. And in contrast to the K shell, you can see you don't have the same leverage. Okay, why? Because that 1S level wants to go to P's and the P's are to Okay, and get a transition into the D's, which are chemically active uh, electrons uh, in 3D transition metals. Uh, you uh, need to have asymmetry and get these very weak D, uh, S to D transitions that are only uh, allowed. Okay, so how does our institute to electrochemical system work? Again, I want to uh, immediately recognize that this wonderful system is from uh, Martin Alps and Pablo Regino, a student. And it's a very simple device, actually. Here it is uh, in the six electric CLS. It's basically a modified uh, piece of uh, printed circuit board. So we machine the back, we uh, uh, make uh, contacts on the front side. And the trick is to make uh, these. Uh, electrochemically, uh, sorry, the, the uh, electrode equipped cells, uh, which we get from uh, Mercata, to get the seal <coughs> and bring in the fluid and out the fluid uh, through these via holes in the backside of the bottom of the electrode. So uh, what's special about this device? There are commercial devices that are designed to fit into soft texture systems. They can't work below 500 EB. This system works right down to 200 EB if you want. It's a classic electrochemical system where they're working counter and a uh, reference electrode. Uh, and uh, it's basically a microfluidic device in the sense that there is a glass PDMS composite for channels. And the beauty of this four channel, two in, two out uh, approach is that we can change the electrolyte very quickly. This is in most systems very tough because you're going down very thin tubes into an even thinner layer. The uh, fluid layers we want are two microns thick. And you've got to go over a couple of hundred microns. Uh, and so what this is, is it's a demo of the speed of changing two different optical dyes. 
And uh, by switching one uh, syringe pump to pump one dye through versus the other dye, you can watch the uh, uh, imaging at the two different energies where the dye is likely made uh, change from one to the other. And it takes place in this particular example, maybe two or three minutes. More typically, it takes 10 to 20 minutes. Okay, so uh, we use that to advantage. Again, get a little bit of a picture of the device. Uh, the inlet and outlet are through these uh, uh, PET cell uh, tubing uh, coming into the device. Okay, so what are we looking for? Okay, we, we, we've got a tool. Uh, we'll show you eventually we can do technography on this system. What do we might expect to gain? Well, there's two important uh, subjects that have been argued about a lot over the last, uh, let's say, three to four years. One is, uh, what is the importance of the size and morphology? People are looking at maybe different crystal facets, they're looking at cubes or triangles, all sorts of things. And I'll show you some of this. Uh, this sequence here is a, a TEM sequence showing the generation of uh, the uh, particles through in situ electrochemistry. Um, and one of the things you see when you carry out the CO2 reaction is morphology changes of these discharges. The second theme is uh, whether or not there is any uh, oxidation state other than pure metal at the actual uh, conditions for uh, electric paralysis and CO2 reduction. And again, this is where we're going to excel because we can map out the uh, oxidation state uh, uh, in the system. So our typical experiment uh, is uh, Starting with a clean cell, nothing on the working electrode. We have a thin area which have better X ray penetration, so we can do better spectroscopy at that point. And uh, by doing an electrode deposition, uh, running a short CD uh, with a dilute solution of copper sulfate and potassium uh, chloride with a, a low flow rate, we can get these particles deposited. And if we do the same experiment, same conditions, uh, ex situ without the constraints of the small the thin layer. Of electrolyte, we get a few hundred nanometer particles. Again, we're limited by sticks and uh, resolution there. But if we go to the SM and look at the same particles, we're exactly in the same deal. So uh, we're looking at relevant materials. And then once we have that uh, electro deposited copper, we change our electrolyte from copper sulfate, uh, potassium chloride to uh, um, a bicarbonate, uh, sodium or potassium bicarbonate with a uh, a saturation of carbon dioxide, the substrate for the catalytic reaction. We can measure the thickness of our uh, fluid layer uh, in favorable circumstances. It's less than two microns, more typically two to three microns. And that's a nice compromise because we have enough ions in the solution to have good electrochemistry inside the cell. At the same time, the water layer is thin enough we can actually measure. So uh, this is in measuring a small area uh, of that uh, sample. And when we do the mapping based on our reference spectra, you see that in this case, the copper metal and the copper one C2O type uh, materials are spatially separated. So we have uh, green grains and red grains, if you want. And uh, we can do a more quantitative analysis and you find that even though the mapping is essentially pure uh, copper, there's still uh, roughly 30% of the copper one. And this is very typical of this preparation. You get this mix of copper one and copper zero. And the question is, when do they actually convert to pure copper as you go to the reductive potentials where the CO2 reduction is going to happen? And so that's the next step we do. We take our material, in this case, these mixed particles of uh, copper uh, one and copper uh, zero, and then start to drop the potential into the regime where CO2 reduction is expected. And so a little change, we lose uh, portions of the material that the core stays copper one. As we go to more negative potentials, and you're seeing circles there to, to, to tell you where you're adding it, by the time you're at minus 0 0.2 volts versus the reversible hydrogen electrode, which is about minus 0.6 in our device, because we have a gold referencing, uh, you get, at least from our analysis, almost pure copper. And that continues all the way down. And we interpret the uh, improved uh, the higher current as the signature that we are carrying out the CO2 reaction. One and a half uh, microns of current in a very small class, very small surface. Okay, so now we have to do quantitative analysis. And we, when we look at this, both of these four energy stacks that I talked about before, plus 50 energy stacks of the better chemistry, you know, modulo uh, a few uh, small amounts of apparent uh, copper one, 
we're really saying down in the regime where uh, the reduction is happening, it's going to be pure carbon. And this is something that people are still arguing about. Did the same experiment here at Max 4, uh, very much the same sort of story, although we have very pretty core shell type project where the core is copper and each particle has a uh, surrounding of copper one. So the nature of these particles, the starting point for the catalytic reaction really changes a lot. That's one of the things that I'm noticing to do this experiment. But again, as we go into the negative potential where CO2 happens, it's all copper. Okay, so let's go to picography. Let's get rid of that boring description stuff. So here is an example uh, with a dry sample. So uh, same sort of copper preparation. And what you see is on that particular little green area here, the spectrum that's definitely copper zero because you see the same species. And uh, not the prettiest image, but it certainly has much better uh, and, uh, spatial resolution than the corresponding uh, six inches. As I can show you in terms of the comparison one to one of uh, mapping the copper zero, the six and the So uh, in the field of view mapping, and again, uh, in this particular example, although we don't really have the quality of the spectroscopy that I would like, you can certainly differentiate the ones that are assigned to copper one from those that are copper zero because of the absence of the zines type features in higher energy. There's still some challenges with the uh, max for uh, stopping the next year. But last October, we had the opportunity to run at the uh, Soleil uh, six and Picardia field. And uh, this is very nice. The camera, which is enclosed in the shield, with some cooling and very fancy electronic readouts. Uh, is one of these Diana cameras, which has been cannibalized to uh, very efficiently uh, get the signal out while not having uh, some of the parts of the system that we has delivered format, which is basically for uh, optical super resolution. Uh, so uh, there is certainly technical development on the detector side that's ongoing as, as we speak. So again, we did the uh, ex situ pegography, i.e. dry. Uh, again, we got very nice results. And I'm not going to belabor this, but at that particular installation, you could convince yourself that if you're looking at a one by one area, the pegography as done there is three to four times faster than uh, the Stixum, mostly because the Stixum is not that efficient. Obviously, you get better resolution, but you also get better statistics. You're putting a lot more photons to your sample. And at the same time, because we use a different spot, we end up having a lower dose than we do with sticks. So there are a lot of advantages that at first sight you would think are not going to be the problems of technology. And this is just a question I raised. I think as technography in the soft x ray gets more and more efficient, there will be advantages, uh, particularly with the focus probes to, to do the experiment. Okay, so what did we do? So here are the spectra recorded in psychographic mode, and you can see that it looks just the same as the sticks. So we're getting good spectroscopy now in that system. This is one of these systems. Again, this is in a fluid cell uh, with control of potential, predominantly copper zero, but some copper one. Uh, we do these color combination maps two ways, where you get the spatial distribution even of minority species, with a little bit of copper two that's present at the formation. Uh, but this is a much better way in the context of our experiment where you basically uh, min max all three of the component maps and you see it's predominant. Copies. We again get the phase spectroscopy, much, much not as clean as some of the other phase spectroscopy we've done with other systems, but it shows exactly the interesting features that the phase dip of the copper two material uh, is uh, a good two volts below the main. Uh, 2P to uh, uh, 4S transition. Then again, we can map with phase. Of course, we don't know how to quantify, but we can phase map. And we get the same answer, except that because phase is much, much more sensitive to other various perturbations of the interaction of the sample and the evolution of the code, uh, it's not as clean uh, as we do. Okay, so now we're doing it all in situ. Uh, here is again a six and picography comparison, which is on the Trump's piece. Uh, and uh, again, using one like your defocus spot, uh, and really uh, half the time, right, in this particular case. Uh, the four energy maps are very nicely here. Uh, and so we can map uh, not just like single energies, but 
this uh, chemical mapping using the four energies and thinning through reference spectra, and you can see um, appreciable uh, improvement in spatial resolution. Again, it's not record typography spatial resolution in soft x ray by any means, but it's making improvements. And the important thing is we're doing it on wet samples. So, again, the uh, sort of one where we're really starting to con uh, make contact with the problem, scientific problems in the field. This is now an individual one of these uh, nanocubes, okay? And uh, measured by typography under electrochemical conditions. Do the analysis. We can see this particular particle is a mixed copper zero copper one. We carry out the uh, reduction conditions and the CO2 saturated bicarbonate, and we see this onset of a current below minus 0.8 eV, indicative of the CO2 reduction. And we can then track both at single energies and also in terms of chemical mapping. And uh, by the time we've gotten sort of down here, about minus 0.4 uh, or, or so, the material has become pure copper. And what you do see is this transformation of the material, dendritic uh, spall S, again, which has been seen in much more clarity in the electron microscopy community. So uh, we can address this question. Uh, is it copper one under the CO2 R conditions with our sensitivity? No. Does uh, the uh, reaction involve reconstruction of the particles? Our answer is yes, that we can see modifications of the envelope of the particles. Okay, just to wrap things up, because I think we're running out of time. So uh, just a couple of summary comments. First of all, uh, why do you want to do spectrotypography? Obviously, higher spatial, spatial resolution. And ultimately, if we get everything tuned up, stability of the instruments, the uh, stability of the probe, uh, we ought to ultimately get to diffraction limited, wavelength limited resolution, which is around two nanometers at the crop range. Um, you have the same kind of sensitivity as classic transmission absorption, uh, and it uses a focus drive to be reduced dose. Uh, there are disadvantages if we use optimized fix them. In fact, the guard is still slower, uh, and I think it can go a lot faster. Uh, there are cameras coming on the market which are about two to three times faster than Diana, which will transmit a megapixel image in uh, uh, about uh, 20, well, depends, 40, 40 milliseconds. Basically. The reconstruction time is still a challenge, but that's getting faster and faster. And there's efforts at the ALS to only look at reconstructions, to automate the whole analysis process so that while you're measuring, you're looking at real space data, not at the country. Um, yeah, and so really uh, making an efficient system so that you can rapidly switch from sticks into navigation and preliminary work and then high resolution studies with typography is really the goal. And uh, many people at different facilities working, working towards it. Okay, so just to summarize our efforts, we had set out a target to follow uh, electrochemical reactions in situ. We have done that very nicely, I think, in a number of systems. We want to improve resolution ex situ typography. This is an example from the CLS, that's very much in hand. Uh, but really, what we're very happy about and we're trying to get published in. Uh, and uh, major communications is the uh, advance of in-situ spectrophotography. What we'd really like to do is have more control over the initial states of the catalyst so that we can say it's a cube or a triangle, core shell or pure particles, et cetera. And so far it's been a little bit hit and miss uh, and what not to get to that. What's really exciting is to be able to work at the carbon edge because at the carbon edge, you have product analysis capabilities. We've shown we can measure spectra of CO2 in the bicarbonate electrolyte. Uh, we have yet to see any signs of the products of the ethylene or carbon monoxide. But they're nice targets from the point of view of gas phase spectroscopy. They're very sharp, intense price structures. So it should be possible. It's a matter of optimizing things. I'm not going to talk about that. Uh, and obviously, uh, the range of studies one can do is much, much beyond just CO2. COD reduction measures. Okay, finalize, uh, final with uh, some acknowledgements. Uh, it's been really an exciting few years. So, working with Drew and his very expanding group uh, in regard to identifying the science of interest. Uh, as with all synchrotron experiments, it's so, so important to have 
uh, talented uh, staff scientists that you can collaborate with. I want to especially acknowledge Tola Kulichuk, who's no stranger here at Max 4, helped to set up the uh, uh, Saki Max Dixon, David Shapiro at the Advanced Life Source, Jan Lang at the CLS, uh, with some funding sources and recognition. So, and there, thank you very much. <laughs>